Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and a very warm welcome to this current legal problems lecture. I'm delighted that this evening um, we have Professor Rebecca Williams um, addressing us on a, a subject that it's almost difficult to imagine anything could be more of a pressing and current legal problem. Um, my role is primarily um, to introduce the chair of uh, the lecture. That's my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Veal, whom I'm, I'm delighted to welcome. He's an associate professor in digital rights and regulation faculty of laws here at UCL. He researches and publishes across um, law, computer science and public policy, focusing on the challenges of power and justice that digital technologies and their users may create and exacerbate. Um, so I, I think you, know, you can see from that that he is the, the perfect chair for the event. Michael, I'm really grateful to you for, for, for doing this. Um, thank you very much. I'll hand over to you now, if I may. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's really you know, uh, great to see everyone here, and I can just see the participants list. There's a uh, great, uh, great audience we've got. So it's my pleasure uh, to be the one to introduce uh, Professor Rebecca Williams. Um, I'm Professor Rebecca Williams, Professor of Public Law and Criminal Law at Pembroke College in Oxford, and she comes from Cambridge and Birmingham previously, where she did a PhD, and works at the intersection of law and technology, and has really been developing some fascinating work, uh, both in terms of research, but also institutional, educational, in the last few years around this space, and I think is uh, really leading the UK in many ways in, in synthesising this together. Um, particularly, she co-founded uh, Altep, that's the Oxford Law Tech Education Program, and uh, I can say for myself, I've, I've you know, heard lots about this program, and it's really bringing together people from all over and teaching undergrads, postgrads, people from law, computer science, doctoral students, all at once, and, and it's really very, very impressive, and I don't know of a, a clear parallel happening right now in a UK university, particularly, I think, um, Professor Williams needs uh, a lot of credit for doing this at the University of Oxford, which is notoriously, you know, uh, very difficult to bridge all of these uh, institutions together. So to undertake uh, such an ambitious uh, area of synthesis of work is, is uh, really fantastic. And I think this is also what uh, we are all here to hear uh, Professor Rebecca Williams talk about today in her lecture for current legal problems on accountable algorithms, adopting the public law toolkit outside the realm of public law. And I'm excited. I'm particularly excited because what I see now in this space are uh, a variety of scholars from areas like public law, criminal law, coming and bringing their own disciplinary uh, expertise and uh, to a debate that has maybe been a bit siloed in the past. And we're getting some really exciting uh, contributions in this space. Um, and I think uh, we're going to get some really exciting uh, contributions today. I'll point everybody to the Q&A, so you can prepare questions as you go through and we'll, we'll steer and visit them at the end. Um, but without further ado, I'll pass over to Rebecca, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Michael, and thank you very much um, to um, Paul and, and Kat for inviting me. I'm hoping you can now see um, my starting slide. We, we can. Excellent, so that's great. Um, so yes, as you say, what I'm going to be talking about um, is the possibility of rendering algorithms, and in particular algorithmic decision making, more accountable even in the private sector um, by employing the tools that we already have at our disposal in public law. And we know from other spheres that such artificial intelligence can dramatically outperform humans. So the purple and green image on that, that uh, slide is of breast cancer, which along with skin and other forms of cancer can be detected by scans better by AI than by humans. Systems can also process information much more rapidly than humans, so that what would take humans years can be discovered by AI systems far more quickly than that, as in the case of AlphaFold, which has made key discoveries in protein folding, and other forms of AI which have discovered new antibiotics to tackle antibiotic resistant strains like Enterichia coli, which is the blue bacteria in the picture. And of course, we know that machine learning systems can also outperform humans in innovation. So the final picture includes that famous Move 37 from AlphaGo's game against Lisa Dole. Thought initially to be a mistake, it has subsequently been described as beautiful. 
But equally, we all know the potential risks that might be entailed in adopting automated decision making. So things like Cathy O'Neill's warnings about weapons of math destruction. And we know the point that's made by the AI Now Institute, which is at NYU, and that's on the slide, in terms of the scale of impact that such systems can potentially have. Indeed, there's a number of dis such disadvantages. Machine learning systems can lack transparency and operate as black boxes. They can lead to rigidity of decision making, a sort of computer says no approach. The opportunities for decreasing costs that they offer can also raise our levels of tolerance for similarly decreased levels of accuracy by whatever metric we might want to measure that. And they can create the kinds of negative feedback loops that O'Neill identifies, whereby predicting an outcome, something like recidivism, the system thereby creates exactly that outcome. Wachter and Mittelstadt also identify what they call the dangers of unreasonable inferences, noting, among other examples, targets' ability to predict pregnancy and customers, insurers' use of social media data to set premiums, the ability to infer user satisfaction with search results using mouse tracking, and China's far-reaching social credit scoring system. But does ADM really present new challenges? Well, in some ways, the answer to that question is no. So humans are far from perfect. On the contrary, we can base our decisions on hunches, have conscious or unconscious prejudices. We can be affected by our own human experiences and emotions, such as the performance of our favorite football team, and we can act inconsistently. Administrative errors and rigid algorithms can apply even in an analog context without any application of AI, as we've seen from the Ivory Coast and Gittard cases in administrative law. So we shouldn't therefore just assume that because a case involves ADM, it's inevitably going to be novel. But there are ways in which algorithmic decision making in a digital sense does present new challenges. And one of those relates to the question of transparency. Now we're all familiar with the idea I mentioned a moment ago that some particularly non-linear machine learning systems can be less transparent than human decision makers. But it's also perhaps counterintuitively the case that in some ways ADM can be more transparent in terms of factors like the specificity of instruction, the metrics of accuracy that we use to assess the performance of the system or the method by which it was trained. Even the forms and mechanisms of discrimination that might arise from the use of such a system might actually be more predictable and transparent than they would be in the case of a human being. I think of this greater transparency as essentially giving a greater surface area on which there's the potential for the law to bite. And there are other ways in which ADM presents new challenges too. Not only are the metrics for assessing the performance of the system more transparent, they also raise interesting policy questions for us regarding things like which metrics we should use in which contexts. The fact that such systems make predictions on the basis of correlations while humans make decisions on the basis of more causal factors can also present challenges. And of course, there's always that scalability point that we saw earlier. Whatever a human decision maker does, they can't do it at the scale of an ADM system operating across a whole field. There is therefore an increasing sense that we need greater accountability of ADM systems and artificial intelligence more generally. And this is something which becomes apparent through the huge numbers of international standards, declarations and moves towards harder forms of regulation, just a few of which I've illustrated on the slide. Of course, possibly the best known of these initiatives is the EU's proposed AI regulation. What all these proposals search for is a means to ensure that we can benefit from those huge advantages of these systems in terms of their ability to outperform humans in a more cost effective and efficient manner, while at the same time ensuring that they operate fairly and accountably, i.e. that they don't abuse the power that they have. This involves finding a balance and managing trade-offs between factors such as cost, efficiency, fairness and so on. Where such systems are used by government authorities, there's obviously concern about the dangers to which this can give rise, as is outlined very well in Joe Tomlinson and Jack Maxwell's book. And to ensure that the balance is struck correctly in that sphere, I've argued in the OJLS that public law tools need to be adapted and strengthened for use in this new digital context. But I also want to argue that if we do this work successfully in public law, the resulting toolkit actually has the capacity to be useful not just in public law, but potentially also in private contexts too.
Public law and the grounds of judicial review are a ready-made system of tools specifically designed in order to render decision makers accountable and to make precisely the kinds of trade-offs that I mentioned between effectiveness and efficiency on the one hand and fairness on the other. These tools are therefore an obvious place to look for help as we work out how to govern and render accountable algorithmic decision making even in a private context. Now there are two levels to this claim. My first and more modest claim is that many of the existing documents and other efforts to regulate or render accountable the use of ADM refer to concepts which are already familiar to public lawyers, concepts such as meaningful information in the GDPR, relevance in the AI regulation and so on. I argue therefore that in interpreting these concepts we can and we should therefore deploy the public law toolkit as just that, a toolkit which avoids our having to reinvent the wheel on the meaning of such concepts and which allows us to benefit from the work that has been done and will inevitably be done on understanding and elaborating on those concepts in the public sphere even when those concepts are being applied in the private sphere. But I also want to argue that we could, if we wanted, be more ambitious than that. For those who see even private law use of ADM as a more threatening version of private power, which further increases the imbalances even between private entities and individuals, the public law toolkit might be more than just a source of understanding and interpretation of existing rules and could actually become a source of inspiration for any further efforts to prevent abuse of this power. Wachter and Mittelstadt have already responded to the threats they identify by proposing that there should be new private rights, in particular a right to reasonable inferences. What I'm proposing here is that rather than, or in addition to, any such specific private rights, we could actually make use of public law as a more general framework of tools based on preventing decision making wrongs and preventing an abuse of power. I'll propose this either as a means of informing future regulation or, as I'll also explain, through common law supervisory jurisdiction. Now, of course, there is, as this slide shows, a lot of existing regulation from various contexts, which does relate to the use of algorithmic decision making, even by private entities, though I don't propose to go through it all in detail now, you'll be pleased to hear. This is also an area in which there's a lot of potential for further development, things like competition laws, digital units and the proposal for regulation of entities with strategic market status. Nevertheless, notwithstanding all these various forms of regulation, there are gaps in the protection provided. Some of these gaps come from a lack of full understanding of what precisely some of the requirements in force actually require. The classic example of this being that issue of meaningful information about the logic involved in the GDPR, about which I'll say more shortly, or the appropriate level of accuracy requirement in the AI regulation. But beyond these, there are more substantive gaps. These can arise where legislation doesn't apply at all. For example, GDPR Article 22 only applies where a decision is based solely on automated processing. And as Wachter and Mittelstadt point out, it only really deals with the information to be given to the data subject, not with the quality of the decision making itself. Similarly, Agarwal notes the data protection gap in consumer credit markets. Equalities legislation only applies to certain protected characteristics, not to other characteristics, such as, to take Borgesius's example, poverty. This may, of course, overlap with a protected characteristic, but it need not. And in some instances, there is just no legislation in existence or in force. Further examples of these different kinds of gaps can also be seen within the AI regulation. So evaluation or classification of trustworthiness on the basis of characteristics likely to lead to detrimental or unfavorable treatment of natural persons in unrelated contexts or in a disproportionate manner is only prohibited when undertaken by public authorities. There's no similar prohibition for private parties. And for high risk AI systems like employment or creditworthiness, although there are a series of protections which should be put in place, it's not clear what each of these involve. And in particular, it's not clear what Article 15's requirement of inter alia an appropriate level of accuracy and robustness might entail. Indeed, this last requirement envisages in some instances further gap filling via harmonised standards with which providers can declare their systems in conformity. If we turn to competition law, at first sight, it may very well appear to be the perfect tool for use in this context. 
But one difficulty with this assumption is that, as Raki has argued, there's no clear consensus on the right scope of competition law or on what level of intervention would be adequate, making it difficult to know precisely how it would operate in this context. And even if enforcement is deemed necessary, the price centric focus of the discipline and its past theories of harm may result in suboptimal application of it. Article 102, in order to establish whether or not there has been an abuse of a dominant position, requires a definition of the market and a determination of market power to establish whether or not the entity is dominant. That can be difficult in the digital economy. Not unrelatedly, it's also therefore the case that competition actions can take a long time, as was the case in Google Shopping, and limited remedies may undermine the ability of competition law to restore competition and safeguard consumer interests. Even if competition agencies appreciate the need to adjust their implementation and develop new theories of harm, they may fail to convince the court. And since competition is also a regulator-led field, it's also inevitable that regulators will have to prioritise their time and resources in choosing which issues to tackle, which reduces the chances that an individual re will receive any redress or relief in a given instance. For all these reasons, therefore, while competition law might in theory be an excellent tool for addressing these problems, it is in fact, as Ezraki and others argue, a tool which is ill-suited to some of the new issues in the digital economy. And as Ezraki and Stucky point out, the same applies in the context of anti-competitive agreements and concerted practices. There are a number of ways listed on the slide in which algorithms can facilitate collusion without triggering the article in question, Article 101. So again, the bottom line is that competition law is a great tool but suboptimal when dealing with some of the new issues in the digital economy. For precisely these and other reasons, the EU Commission has proposed two new pieces of legislation, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. So would these close the gap, even assuming that they become law in both the EU and the UK? Well, to some extent, yes. But first, the DMA only applies to gatekeepers, i.e. those with a significant impact on the internal market, operating a core platform service and enjoying an entrenched and durable position. The Commission can also designate gatekeepers following a market investigation, but of course, like the same issue in existing competition law, that will take time. Significant impact means a turnover of at least 6.5 billion euros or more, or market capitalisation of 65 billion euros and more than 45 million monthly EU end users or more than 10,000 yearly active EU businesses. And the EP, the European Parliament, has proposed raising those thresholds to 8 and 80 billion euros respectively. Even if it is triggered, the DMA focuses on economic behaviour, such as ensuring that businesses can offer the same products through a competitor service at a lower price, ensuring that businesses can form additional contracts with end users without using the gatekeeper platform, and refraining from requiring anyone to sign up to additional services as a precondition of using the core platform services. And it's to be enforced by the Commission, meaning that, again, it's not ideal for individual redress and it's likely to be subject to similar regulatory prioritisation. The DSA does cover content moderation and after an amendment by the EP, problematic nudging, for example, to re accept rejected cookies. But it has an exemption for micro and small enterprises. And in any case, it specifically envisages ju judicial redress in relation to content moderation, which leaves the question regarding how that's to be achieved. Similarly, Regulation 2019-1150 applies only to online intermediation services, i.e. those which allow businesses, business users to offer goods or services to consumers where there's a contractual relationship between the business user and the OIS. So in other words, in an instance where no protected characteristics were relevant, none of these pieces of legislation would therefore apply to a situation in which, for example, an employer used a hiring algorithm which discriminated against those from a low socio-economic background. An algorithm used by a delivery or ride hailing service which rejected drivers born in the north of England. A bank which disproportionately refused credit to those using one particular web browser. Or Wachter and Mittelstadt's example of an insurer which adjusts premiums based on social media use. Such examples might have one of the lawful bases specified in Article 22, but even there, I would argue, we might need to examine the precise virees conferred by those bases. So, although there is some regulation of ADM, even in the private context, there are also still gaps, either because there's no legislation in force or proposed, or because if there is, it's not clear precisely what that legislation entails. 
It's here that I want to argue that the public law toolkit, or more specifically, the grounds of judicial review, can play a useful and significant role. Now, although they're no doubt familiar to most people, by way of a quick reminder, administrative law requires that a public decision maker should follow a fair procedure, which means not being biased, hearing from the right people, and in some circumstances, giving reasons for its decision. The decision maker must have the jurisdiction or the power to make the decision. It must take into account all the right considerations and only the right considerations in reaching its decision. It must not fetter or delegate its discretion and its decision must be reasonable or proportionate. To return to the modest version of my claim, as we've just seen, many documents and existing efforts to regulate or render accountable algorithmic decision making, even in a private context, refer to concepts which are already very familiar to public lawyers or which open the door to the use of public law principles. My argument is that the public law toolkit can be used here to help interpret those concepts without our needing to reinvent the wheel. I want to look at two examples which illustrate this. First is the decision in Braganza and BP shipping. This is in fact not an example from the digital but rather from the purely analogue context. Mr Braganza was employed by BP shipping and was lost at sea. His widow claimed death benefits from BP, but the latter concluded that Mr Braganza had committed suicide and thus the benefits were not payable. His widow appealed and the question which arose for decision in the case was what standard the decision of a contractual fact finder, here BP, had to reach. In other words, how reasonable did BP's finding of fact that Mr Braganza had committed suicide have to be? Baroness Hale, with whom Lord Kerr and Lord Hodge agreed, held at paragraph 18 that contractual terms in which one party to the contract is given the power to exercise a discretion or to form an opinion as to relevant facts are extremely common. It is not for the courts to rewrite the party's bargain for them, still less to substitute themselves for the contractually agreed decision maker. Nevertheless, the party who's charged with making decisions which affect the rights of both parties to the contract has a clear conflict of interest. That conflict is heightened where there is a significant imbalance of power between the contracting parties, as there will often be in an employment contract. The courts have therefore sought to ensure that such contractual powers are not abused. They've done so by implying a term as to the manner in which such powers may be exercised a term which may vary according to the terms of the contract and the context in which the decision-making power is given. At paragraph 19, the court drew an obvious parallel between cases where a contract assigns a decision-making function and cases where a statute or prerogative assigns a decision-making function to a public authority. The court in such cases cannot, held the majority, substitute for the decision-maker and instead adopts the appropriate standard of review. At paragraph 20, the majority continue by noting that the decided cases reveal an understandable reluctance to adopt the fully developed rigour of the principles of judicial review of administrative action in a contractual context, but noted that at the same time they have struggled to articulate precisely what the difference might be. They conclude, therefore, in paragraph 28, that there are signs that the contractual implied term is drawing closer and closer to the principles applicable in judicial review. As a result, the majority held that on the facts, the interpretation of the contract should be in accordance with both limbs of the public law Wednesbury test, ensuring both that the right factors are taken into account and that the decision should not be one which no reasonable decision maker could reach. And Briganza is not an aberration. Indeed, Lim and Chan note a number of other contexts in which the courts have taken a similar approach. The second set of examples I want to consider do come from the digital context but do not yet demonstrate the courts applying the public law toolkit in the way that they did in Braganza. Nonetheless, I want to argue that it's a context which is ripe for precisely that to happen. Articles 13, 14 and 15 of the GDPR all state that the data subject has the right, among other things, to meaningful information about the logic involved. Now, as many of you will know, there has been a lively academic debate on what precisely that entails with Goodman and Flaxman arguing that it gives a full right to explanation, which would thus limit the ability to use machine learning algorithms. Conversely, back to Mittelschlass and Faridi have argued that the GDPR's right of access only grants an explanation addressing system functionality, not the rationale and circumstances of specific decisions. Selbston Powell's, on the other hand, think neither of those views is quite correct. For them, the right to explanation should be interpreted functionally, flexibly, and should at a minimum enable a data subject to exercise their GDPR and human rights, 
a view shared by Kaminsky, and one which also fits with the view of the Article 29 Working Party, now the European Data Protection Board, that the information provided should be sufficiently comprehensive for the data subject to understand the reasons for the decision, such as details of the main characteristics considered in reaching the decision, the source of this information and the relevance. But actually, while this debate has been taking place in a GDPR specific context, there's actually already an area of public law which deals with precisely this issue. The duty to give notice in particular is well established at common law. And even in the context of closed material procedures, CMPs, it's been held that D must often be told the gist of the case against them. In Borgas, Lord Reed held that a prisoner's right to make representations is largely valueless unless he knows the substance of the case being advanced. That will not normally require the disclosure of the primary evidence, but what is required is genuine and meaningful disclosure of the reasons why the decision was made. So general statements about the prisoner's behavioural risk were not therefore held to be sufficient. It seems likely, therefore, that this idea of gisting could be extremely useful in furthering our understanding of meaningful information of the logic involved in keeping with the view of Selbston Powell's. This suggestion also fits with the ICO's guidance, which states that it's vital that individuals understand the reasons underlying the outcome of an automated decision or a human decision that's been assisted by the results of an AI system. If the decision was not what they wanted or expected, this allows them to assess whether they believe the reasoning of the decision is flawed. If they want to challenge the decision, knowing the reasoning supports them to formulate a coherent argument for why they think this is the case. And this is not the only context in the GDPR in which this could happen. More broadly, Article 5 of the GDPR states that personal data shall be processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner in relation to the data subject. These concepts are then defined in more detail to some extent elsewhere in the GDPR. For example, fair and transparent processing is to be further achieved by provision of the information listed in Articles 13.2 and 14.2, things like the period for which the data will be stored and that meaningful information provision. But beyond this, there's no formal definition of any of the terms such as fairness or lawfulness. Similarly, Article 40 refers to the need to draw up codes of conduct to contribute to the proper application of the GDPR for the purpose of specifying the application of the regulation, such as with regard to what's meant by fair and transparent processing. And again, the proposed AI regulation refers in Article 13 to transparency requirements. So where better to look for guidance on the meaning of these concepts than in an area of law based on achieving precisely those things in relation to public in relation to public authorities. Indeed, if we look at the way in which the GDPR is set up, its whole approach is actually similar to that of public law. In order to process data lawfully, you must have a legal basis for that processing, whether a legal obligation, necessity for performance for contract or whatever it might be, you have to point to that lawful basis in order to process. In other words, in public law terms, you need specific virus for your processing. And there are other aspects of the GDPR which also echo public law, such as Article 22.3's requirement that the data subject must have at least the right to obtain human intervention on the part of the controller to express his or her point of view and to contest the decision, which is highly reminiscent of public law's rules on over-delegation, fettering and fair hearings. The last example I want to look at is the proposed AI regulation. This states that high-risk AI systems which make use of techniques involving the training of models shall be developed according to a series of quality criteria. And a number of these criteria, which I've highlighted in blue on the slide, refer to concepts which again are highly familiar to public lawyers. So developers must make relevant design choices in designing the system. Their data preparation processing operations, such as annotating and labelling, must also be relevant and they must formulate relevant assumptions about what the data represents. The data sets must be assessed for suitability and developers must identify any possible data gaps or shortcomings. Training, validation and testing data sets shall again be relevant and have appropriate statistical properties and they shall take into account the characteristics or elements that are particular to the context in which the system is to be used. Now, whereas this concept of relevance is relatively undefined in the regulation, public law already has a developed understanding of what relevance might require in certain instances. Now, it's not as if public law is perfect on this front, and I've identified in particular challenges that public law may have with factors which are highly correlative but not causative of the target outcome, and administrative law will need to develop rules to govern the relevance or irrelevance of such factors. But 
Once this development has taken place, it's then ripe for deployment in interpreting the meaning of relevant outside public law too. Note also that one of the requirements I mentioned on the previous slide was that users of high risk AI systems should examine gaps in their data, which is very similar to the requirement that public authorities should take into account relevant considerations. I also highlighted the requirement that users of high risk AI systems specifically should take into account certain factors such as the purpose, characteristics or elements which are relevant to the particular application of that AI system which also sounds very like the public law requirement to take certain relevant considerations into account. So we can see that all these terms are in fact concepts which already exist in public law and thus the public law toolkit could help us to interpret these terms. But beyond the use of public law as a toolkit to interpret existing rules, I think a more ambitious claim can be made for its usefulness in rendering algorithmic decision making more accountable. There are those who see the use of ADM even in the private context as posing a particular threat, which represents the rise of a new species of power. For example, Shoshana Zuboff in the Age of Surveillance Capitalism analogizes the growth of what she calls instrumentarianism to the growth of totalitarianism, arguing that just as we failed initially to recognize or to name totalitarianism, so we are doing the same with the new and rising challenge of instrumentarianism. This new form of power operates through the means of behavioural modification and, in her view, converges with the digital to achieve its own unique brand of social domination, not as a political project like totalitarianism, but through the market. And if we return to the dangers of unreasonable inferences that Bacter and Mittelstadt identify, there's no question that there are gaps in the existing legislation and areas where there have been calls for new protection in the form of regulation or legislation of these new forms of private power. Factor and Mittelstadt's own solution to this is to argue for a new right to reasonable inferences as part of data protection law, arguing that data protection law should extend beyond data collection and retention to examining what's done with that data subsequently. But there are three potential arguments against taking that approach. First, as they acknowledge themselves, referring to the work of Pertova, the danger is that the law of data protection in the, is, turns, the, sorry, that it turns the law of data protection into the law of everything. A similar argument could be made in relation to competition law, referring back to Ariel Izraki's sponge article. Second, the problem isn't just that such issues are not questions of data protection, it's that they are potentially something else. As Gandhi puts it, the issue is not simply a question of privacy. The real issue at stake is not personal privacy, it's power gains of bureaucracies, both private and public, at the expense of individuals and the non-organised sectors of society by means of gathering information and by means of intensive record keeping. In other words, the problem is what he calls the panoptic sort. And third, an individual rights approach may not be the best means for resolving the problem for two reasons. First, it requires there to be someone with sufficient standing to bring the claim, which if the damage is diffuse, there may not be, and indeed those being harmed may not, as Mantelero points out, even be aware that this is the case, a concept familiar from other contexts, such as those dealing with workers and consumer rights. And second, and connectedly, well, Yoan points out that if we focus on individual rights, we lose sight of the social, relational aspects of data and what she calls the supra-individual interests to which it can give rise. Properly representing and adjudicating among those interests, she argues, necessitates far more public and collective, i.e. democratic forms of governing data production. Individualist data subject rights cannot represent, let alone address, these population level effects. So my suggestion is that we change our focus and rather than looking at how we might use private rights, we should instead examine the potential offered by a public wrongs approach. Rather than focusing exclusively on the potential private rights of those affected, we should focus instead on the decision makers abuse of its power. Now, of course, there is, even within public law, a discussion over the extent to which public law does focus on public private rights or public wrongs. We know that Justice Sedley in Ex Party Dixon stated that public law is about public wrongs, not private rights. But we also know that writers such as Taggart and Verujas have suggested that it might not be so simple. For my purposes here, it's not necessary for us to enter those debates. The very fact that public law is an area used to considering and entertaining both those perspectives means that it's very well set up to play exactly the role that Vion, Mantelero and others suggest is necessary.
This approach also puts the focus more directly on what we really want, which is the ability to harness the benefits of the decision making process without enabling the capacity for abuse of power and systemic damage. To have the ability to balance the need of the decision maker to use ADM for its own purposes without interference against the need for compliance with a minimum set of rules to prevent abuse of power on the part of the decision maker. So how exactly would this work? The first option is that we can use the public law toolkit to inform the shape of any future regulation of this area. This is a natural extension of the use I've already suggested for it, according to which it can be used to inform and interpret existing regulation. If we return to the contents of the public law toolkit that I outlined a moment ago, we saw that some of these are already operating in the private context. The requirement that decision makers must give reasons for their decisions connected to the meaningful information requirement in the GDPR. The requirement of a valid basis for processing data in the GDPR is strongly reminiscent, as we saw, of the public law requirement that there should be virees, power or jurisdiction to make the decision. We saw that the public law rules on relevance could be used to interpret that term where it's used in the AI regulation. And the lack of human oversight and control can also be understood by reference to public law's rules preventing over-delegation and fettering. But the other grounds of review can be developed for use in this context too. The requirement that decision makers take into account all the right considerations and only the right considerations might also be a better public wrongs way to deal with the reasonable inference problem in a manner which also deals with the super individual issues which might arise from considering the wrong factors or indeed failing to consider the right ones. And the public law rule that decision makers should not make unreasonable or disproportionate decisions might give us another means of tackling those unreasonable inferences as well as any negative feedback loops or other kinds of decision giving rise to super individual harm. The other great advantage of the public law toolkit is that in addition to these substantive grounds, public law is also an excellent source of inspiration on balancing the interests of the individual with those of the general public, the discretion of the decision maker and so on. This balancing approach could therefore be openly used in crafting regulation which would not just give a right to algorithmic due process, as Crawford and Schultz have called it, but protection from algorithmic abuse of power. So, public law can certainly be used as an inspiration for regulation which has to strike a difficult balance between permitting and prohibiting certain behaviour. But could it do more than this? Could the grounds of judicial review be used directly by the courts, even in the private context? Well, even before Braganza, there has been a history of academic commentary in favour of the use of public law in relation to private parties. This arose from its use in a variety of well-known cases dealing with restraint of trade, like Nagel and Fielden and Bragley and the Jockey Club, as well as those dealing with common callings such as innkeepers and ferrymen. And of course, now one might wonder what a digital ferryman might be and think of it as a potentially wider version of the Commission's gatekeeper concept, perhaps. Commentators in favour of this expansion of public law included, of course, Lord Wolfe in the 1986 edition of Public Law, John Laws in his 1997 Public Law article, and Borry, who was then the Director General of Fair Trade in charge of the Office of Fair Trading, who argued that the natural concern of public law to ensure the accountability of public bodies might usefully be complemented by further adaptation and expansion so as to ensure that powerful private bodies are made more accountable the growing acceptance of a philosophy that all those who wield power should be more accountable and should be subject to general principles of good administration indicates possibilities for developing the role of the courts in controlling the power of private corporations and self-regulator bodies. This was of course famously developed by Oliver in her 1997 article and 1999 book Common Values and the Public-Private Divide, suggesting that both public and private law share five common values. She also clarified the relationship between public and private law, seeing no difficulty with an overlap in substance, regarding the distinction as merely procedural, focusing on what was then the Order 53 public law as opposed to the private law procedure. And there's a degree of support for the approach from the private law perspective as well as the public one. In his 1995 book, Parkinson wrote that companies are able to make choices which have important social consequences. They make private decisions which have public results. It's possession of this kind of power that gives rise to a distinct need for justification, which forms the basis for the claim that companies must be required to act in the public interest. Now, his approach and suggestions for affecting this outcome focus on the development of company law, along with other techniques such as board structure, disclosure and consultation duties, rather than public law directly. But of course, disclosure and consultation are also to be found in public law. <laughs> 
Support for the adoption of public law tools in a private law context also comes from Sale's more recent article, though his focus is on Padfield and coherence with a joint endeavour and proper purposes by reference to the agreement, rather than on Weddensbury and the imposition of external constraints. So could this work? Could the idea of a common law supervisory jurisdiction based on the toolkit of public law be given new life in the digital context? Well, Oliver is right that the distinction between public and private power is hard to track. There are typically two factors which determine the application of public law, a public law element, and some kind of imbalance or monopoly of power. But as Lord Newberger has pointed out in YL, what one regards as a public function is so inherently the product of one's own political beliefs that it can't actually do any useful work in drawing the distinction, meaning that imbalance of power is the key consideration even in a public law context. And even in a private context, the GDPR accepts that an imbalance of power preventing true consent can arise even between private parties. And we know that, as Wachter and Mittelstadt argue, privacy and data protection themselves stem from the idea that an individual should have the right to be left alone by the state, and that the right to privacy was originally proposed as a defence mechanism against governmental surveillance. To some extent, even in a public law context, there's an understanding that the grounds of review are common law concepts developed by the courts, all of which suggests that public and private law are not so separate as we might think, and that the use of tools from the one context in the other is not impossible. That said, even at a substantive level, there remains a difference between public and private law on the basis that administrative law used against public authorities is applied constitutional law in a way that supervisory jurisdiction over private parties would never be. This understanding of the distinction, I hope, makes it clear that what I'm proposing does not amount to public law imperialism. Instead, what I'm proposing is that the courts could, in principle, develop a supervisory jurisdiction in private law, which makes use of the public law toolkit. There are, of course, detractors from this approach. My namesake Alexander Williams has argued, in relation to the earlier work of Borry, Oliver and so on, that the approach is too uncertain that it's not clear that it's public law's role to prevent abuse of power as opposed to that of contract or tort. He cites Lord Justice Hoffman, as he then was, in Aga Khan, arguing that it's improper to patch up the remedies available against domestic bodies by pretending that they're organs of government. And he argues that the remedies available, such as declarations and injunctions, might be either too weak or too strong. But there are answers to each of those points. In answer to his point that the approach is uncertain, it would become less so precisely by drawing on the existing rules in public law. We need those rules to be certain enough in public law that they can guide public authority action, and that certainty could then be applied across into this context. As for whether this is the role of public law as opposed to contract or tort, it should be remembered that public law tools are specifically designed to control abuses of power in decision making, making them very well suited, as I hope I've demonstrated, to this area. It's these tools, not public law itself, that's being deployed. And further, contract and tort share the problems with individual standing and its ability, inability to deal with super-individual interests to which I averted earlier, as well as in many cases being excludable by contract. And of course, the proposed scheme there, and, and in the proposed scheme, there would be no pretense that private entities were public. This proposal is to take place exclusively within private law. The remedies in question might be an apt in some circumstances, but equally they may also be apt in others and certainly might be better than nothing. In some cases, of course, this control would be better imposed formally via Parliament through regulation drawing on the principles of public law as a blueprint. This would also deal with concerns of uncertainty over whether the rules would arise and give the opportunity for the creation of specifically tailored remedies if declarations and injunctions are indeed thought to be too blunt. We know that in the private sphere, more generally, there are specific regulations to address the imbalance for consumers and in some instances in employment. And we could thus simply add the algorithmic imbalance to these, as Mantelero suggests. But equally, there are advantages to the common law approach too. It's capable of providing individual redress, but also of balancing this against the need to consider the public interest, be deferential on occasion and so on. This would work well alongside regulators' concerns to strike the right balance between effective regulation and the chilling effects of over-regulation. When the law does intervene, public law takes an approach which can adopt both a private rights and a public wrongs perspective, focusing on both individual and super-individual harms.
and it's a bottom-up approach, not a top-down regulatory one, meaning that it's not subject to regulatory prioritisation. Of course, resourcing is still an issue, and as with public law more generally, litigants would be reliant on charities and NGOs to help fund and organise litigation, but such groups do exist. In any event, whether through regulation or the common law, the tools that we've developed to deal with fairness, accuracy, legality and transparency of decision making in a public context should operate as a blueprint for controlling decision making in a private context, as both contexts navigate the same transition from human adjudicative decision making to engineered decision making by statistical inference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was an absolutely fantastic talk. I was gripped throughout, um, and I think I'm sure the rest of the audience were as well. Um, I have questions, but let's move on to see if anyone's put in the Q&A or wants to put a hand up uh, to raise a question. I think you can maybe do that. I'm not sure if you can uh, to, I'm gonna put you on audio if you write a question. Um, but put in, okay, I'll, I'll leave people to put in the chat some questions while uh, they think about it. I think probably they were just too gripped to be typing as you're going. <laughs> Um, so one question I have, and you, you took you know, the way forward and said, how could we do this? And maybe we could just take inspiration, codify it in. Our challenge is say some of the, the regulations you talked about, the AI Act spans you know, European countries, obviously so does GDPR, but also uh, data protection law is now present in you know, hundreds of countries in similar formats. Do you think that each country should you know, draw upon its own public law toolkit and try to draw in to this, or do you think that we could try and codify and just take inspiration and actually propose a new generation of some of these laws? Or where do you see the best uh, the best strategy going? Of course, that you know, Europe's always struggled actually with uh, any harmonization of administrative law. And of course, you see the little intricate workings around of like, Denmark or Estonia or strange things where regulators can't do certain things in law. So I'd love your thoughts on, on ways forward in a more international context rather than just in this jurisdiction. I think it's a, it's a really, really interesting question. Um, and I think, to be honest, either and both would work. And that's one of the advantages, I hope, of what I'm proposing, which is that they can potentially work well together. So you could draw inspiration on the, the pub, sort of public law principles I've been identifying for, with a sort of regulatory approach and, and build those into future regulation. You can also allow a sort of bottom up approach, allowing them to work through the, the sort of ordinary court based systems. In terms of the fact that you have different administrative law, you do, of course you do. And there are different administrative systems, you know, across the world. That said, there are quite a lot of core concepts which are common between them. I mean, some of our concepts, things like proportionality and legitimate expectations have been developed as we had more exposure to those while we were part of, while we were members of the EU and we learnt about those concepts from other systems such as France, Germany and so on. So our administrative law, even domestically, because we had that experience of being in the EU, is not as purely domestic as it, it might once have been and, and already draws on concepts from elsewhere. Um, there is always sort of comparative law going on between the US and, and um, the UK, for example, and again, in lots of ways the US is a very different administrative system it focuses on sort of notice and comment in the formation of rules much more than we do but actually there are still parallels and there are still overlaps where you can see the same tools if you like being used in, a, in American administrative law it, they have a different name and, and they sort of are, are seen in a slightly different way but they're actually doing a very similar job to some of the administrative law rules that we have so actually even if each system did in the absence of any other regulation, use its own public law system, rules and, and toolkit. I don't think you'd end up with anything that was hugely different if you if you sort of looked at them as a whole. And certainly that wouldn't be anything that would stand in the way then of a, a top down and international approach, to which which was which tried to be more uniform across countries. They certainly wouldn't be exclusive of each other. I don't think. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for that. And just as uh, you've been talking, questions have now been pouring in uh, as people have, have just you know. Uh, got to grips with with, uh, with with your talk. I'm going to start um, with uh, uh, Jeremiah uh, Alice Prussell, who's asked a question. I, if I press answer live, does that just mean, oh, I think it doesn't mean you can talk, Jeremiah. I think it just means I have to read out the question. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, Jeremiah asks, to what extent you think that concerns about the role of the judiciary voiced in some quarters, and I think you know, about the, the, uh, you know, the, the discretion in, in the, the given by courts and so on, uh, might be harnessed by big tech to argue and lobby against the developments you propose. I mean, how are you going to be uh, uh, on the front pages as 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 uh, well, you know, in that context soon? So yeah, the, thanks, Je hello, Jeremiah. And thank you. Um, no, that, that that's a very good question. Actually, I think from government's point of view, what I'm proposing is less controversial than government's usual attitude to judicial review. So we know that in normal terms, 
judicial review poses a threat to government discretion and, and when it's used in the public law context that's very much a concern and, and the excessive potential discretion of judges would be seen as un unbalancing the constitution and it's part of the separation of powers and just as courts have to police the boundary between the executive and the legislature so they also have to be careful not to overstep their own boundaries and that you know that inherent tightrope that they have to walk that is the the kind of million dollar question at the heart of, of public administrative law. Um, but actually, what I'm proposing is, is them using that power against private entities. There may be some instances in which government actually might be quite glad of that happening. So when it might be very difficult for a lobbied government to regulate power in that kind of way, having the courts do it on the basis of common law principles, which were already in existence and just applying them in that new context might actually work in a way that that regulation might not because of those those sort of lobbying interests and so on. And certainly, Public, the, the court's use of their discretion in that context is certainly not posing a threat to um, to the government or rivaling government power in any way in that sense. So, um, so I, from that point of view, I think from the government's point of view, this, this is a, a potentially a less a less controversial use of it. And were the big tech companies to argue, oh, this is excessive judicial discretion, well, they can't argue that that is therefore un upsetting some kind of constitutional balance of power in the same way as, as that argument can be made when it's made by government. So I think from that point of view, that's perhaps less of a concern in the use of these tools in, in relation to private parties than it is when they're used in relation to public authorities. I think I'm going to follow that up with a, a similar question that maybe pushes you a bit further from Joe Tomlinson, who I think at exactly at the same moment as Jeremiah had similar things on his mind. Um, and he asked about um, the adaption that might be required uh, by courts and in general. So some say that courts, particularly the appeal courts, are taking a more deferential approach towards public authorities. And so would this make the adaption harder? And I think, you know, jo Joe's point really works nicely with your previous, you know, yes. of course, have that possibility to go that way. Is that going to end up that the public law toolkits actually diverge? We've got two different ones, or they have, you know, these concepts are moving further away from each other as, as uh, the government, they might do things the government would be uh, fine with them doing or even useful in a regulatory sense. So again, really, really interesting question. And, and hello, Joe. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I think that's right, that what I'm proposing is very much they use as a toolkit. So not necessarily containing any particular substantive level of intervention or, or, or and so on in, in a particular context. But what's good, I think, about the public law tools is that not only do they provide those grounds for controlling abuse of power, but they also have that balancing approach where courts have to outline the reasons for a particular, or you know, I would like to see them more outline the reasons for, for intervening at a particular level of intensity in a particular context and in the private context the sorts of considerations they're going to have reference to are going to be very different they're going to be you know deference to commercial interests or deference to economic interests in a way that in the public sphere they would be deference to democratic interests or political interests so the content of that deference and the reasons for it are going to be very different in the two spheres but we know from the public law sphere that that level of deference can go up or it can go down appropriately in the context and yes you might see more deference in the public sphere less in the private sphere or indeed vice versa versa because it will be that kind of context specific balancing but I think that's what's really good about the toolkit is it allows for that context specific balancing. Fantastic um, uh, so we're going to switch tack a bit to uh, as an anonymous attendee and, and they ask about ethics and regulations so a bit of a, 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 a crossover we had a similar question that also came um, in advance in the in the questions that were submitted previously so we can do these together so what's the reason for an ethical approach in AI and algorithms instead of regulation? We're concentrating ethics, and maybe I'll just sort of add to that a little bit to link it to your, to your talk even more. Do you think that this, if we move towards a public law toolkit, what's the role for some of the discussions that have been had around ethics and the literature that's developed around that in that public law toolkit? Are you, are you disintermediating the ethicists or have you, are you going to play nicely with them? So, uh, I, I think I would like to play nicely with them. So I am a lawyer, so I'm inevitably going to say this. I think law done properly is applied ethics. So I think if law is done right, that's exactly what it is. It draws on ethics, but it makes those ethics concrete and enforceable and, and gives rise to rights deriving from them or wrongs deriving from them in a much more concrete and applicable way. So there's there's absolutely room for ethical discussion of what should happen. And in some ways, you know, soft approaches to ethics. And I, I had that slide early on where I had lots of different approaches and and a lot of those are ethical about sort of producing codes of conduct for, for industries and businesses and, and regulators and so on to use. So there absolutely is a space for that kind of thing. But I think if those are going to be more than sort of high level abstract, nice to have ideas, then they do need to be concretized in some instances at least. And that's that's I think what law is, is able to do. So as I say, done properly, they should work very well together. So we've got one question then by um, Sam Rakshita, who's now uh, asked, I actually had a similar 
aspect I want to add to this question as well. So I want to kind of bundle this together and take chairs privilege, but in a in a new kind of way. So uh, Sang asks if you think a lack of significant te technical capacity and understanding of algorithms by judges makes it hard to take that approach to regulation. And I want to also add to that a different side. While we're, while we're talking about technical and analytic capacity, the capacity of the private sector actors themselves. So we often assume in a you know that public authorities uh, do have actually quite a lot of obligations, quite a lot of friction to analyze what they're doing and to spend quite a lot of resources on, on maybe acting more cautiously rather than moving fast and breaking things. And it does seem like apply, applying that approach, even in bits and pieces, would be slowing that down, be adding uh, not baggage just in terms of regulation, but a whole different type of burden on the freedom of these actors to do, to do things. And at what level do we think maybe we should add this at? I mean, some of these companies also don't have very much capacity within their teams to take it, you know, to, to consider the needs of an entire country or a, or a populous or a jurisdiction in a way that a, a public authority might need to. And they never really had that responsibility before. It's not like you know, the public sector equality duty, which had a wide number of people to consider. Instead, companies were, had their markets, maybe they were just focusing on those. So I think you have capacity at both those levels. So for the judges, uh, for private bodies, is your, is your proposal workable in, in the world of capacity? So that, those are really, really interesting questions and really important things for us to explore. So I think um, looking at judicial capacity, first of all, um, as you mentioned earlier, I'm really equally passionate about the idea that we do need to educate lawyers to talk to computer scientists and vice versa. Um, and I think that applies at all levels of the profession. So yes, we're doing it for, for students, but also for people in practice. And, and I think that is going to be vital for the judiciary going forward. That said, we're already seeing quite a lot of technical analysis in certain cases, the um, Bates and the Post Office being a good example, or um, Bridges on the um, South Wales Police use of CCTV, so, and also um, facial recognition. So I think there is, um, I think there already is a, a degree of technical competence in the judiciary. Yes, that will need to expand. It's going to have to expand across the board anyway, in all contexts, you know, in commercial contexts and so on as well. So I don't think my proposal particularly adds to that. I think that is just a challenge facing us as a whole. In terms of additional regulation for um, sort of small and medium sized enterprises, and is this an, an additional potential burden? I think one of, again, one of the things that's good about public law, and one of the things I believe very strongly in as a public lawyer, is the the, um, the judge over your shoulder approach. So this is the, the guide to public law, which is produced for use by the civil service in lay terms. And I believe very strongly that public law needs to be clear enough and predictable enough to be able to guide ex ante decision making by public authorities. And by that, I don't just mean well resourced government departments but also you know individuals operating in local authorities who are also subject to it and I think it's very important for public law and the public law toolkit to be clear enough to be that judge over your shoulder even at a relatively low and local level when at a relatively sort of under-resourced level I think it's really important for it to, to be able to work like that and so done properly if we get the rules of public law right in public law in those contexts then the judge over your shoulder should be equally applicable and workable in a private context. Thanks. We've got one. Well, we haven't got any more in the, in the chat, but I want to ask then the final question. We need to wrap up in a second. It was a really, really fantastic uh, discussion. Um, a lot of you know, particularly large tech companies are constantly in the courts, incredibly litigious, uh, challenging even very, very settled you know, uh, cases that come from CJU on the same facts again and, and have been accused of just prolonging uh, you know, paying huge legal fees to con get a continued license to operate before maybe they shift their business model in the future. And it does seem like your approach would open up a lot of spaces for challenge. We already see data protection regulators deluged by threats to procedurally challenge them under administrative law. People have pointed to the fact that the Irish regulator is pretty clogged up because it is constantly threatened with procedural public law um, uh, challenge uh, by the likes of its uh, the big companies it regulates. Is there a danger that by relying on the public law toolkit, you actually create? Uh, I like at the beginning you said that the surface, the surface of litigation, you know, the algorithms have a high surface area of litigation, that you actually create a larger surface area for litigation uh, and maybe have the opposite effect that you were uh, you were intending. It's possible, but I think actually what it does in a way is, is to redress the balance a little bit. So whereas as you're absolutely right, regulators are subject to the rules of judicial review, 
it would be quite nice if some of those they were regulating were also subject to those rules and that that's effectively what this proposal would do it would allow those that toolkit to be used against precisely those private entities that are making their lives difficult using the principles of judicial review well those precise same principles would be used against those private entities so so my hope is it might redress that balance a little bit fantastic thank you so much rebecca so, so, professor rebecca williams will be uh, seeing i think her writing in this area very soon so keep an eye out on uh, on 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 that and we're all looking forward to uh, to reading reading more um thanks everyone for coming it was a really fantastic evening and i enjoyed myself i think uh, speak for everyone it was it was uh, something i'll be watching back and recommending when we uh, put this uh, online as i think we probably will be doing uh, in the coming days so thank you so much thank you very much michael for chairing and, and to, to paul and kat for inviting yeah. me yeah thanks everyone um, and have a great evening enjoy